All is quiet on the China-India border since the end of the dispute in the Donglang or Doklam area, and the two countries have set out to settle remaining disagreements with the diplomacy. As Japan's uh, Shinzo Abe courts India, we'll consider how the regional power relationships are shaping up in the second part of our show. But first, we'll look at the China-Singaporean relationship as the Singapore's Prime Minister Li Xianlong has been in China for talks aimed by most accounts at improving relations with Beijing. To discuss these issues and more, I'm happy to be joined in the studio first by Dr. Wang Dong, Associate Professor of the School of International Studies at Peking University. And later on, we shall be joined by Ravish Bhatia, Yancheng Academy Scholar of Peking University. We shall also speak via satellite to Professor Lin Tai Wei, adjunct research fellow at National University of Singapore. That's our topic. This is a dialogue. I'm Yang Wei. But before we start, let's take a look at this. The two leaders have just met for the second time in two months, and this time in the Chinese capital. Both President Xi Jinping and Singapore Prime Minister Li Xianlong recalled their meeting in Hamburg, Germany this July. President Xi told Prime Minister Li about the significance of his visit. Our senior leaders of the two countries have laid a solid foundation of bilateral relations. Your visit is significant in boosting bilateral ties. She said China is willing to synergize the Belt and Road Initiative with Singapore's development strategy to improve trade and investment cooperation, proposing more partnership in finance, science and technology, and innovation. Li Xianlong echoed President Xi and said Singapore adheres to the One China policy. As the coordinator of China ASEAN ties and the rotating chair of ASEAN next year, Singapore will spare no efforts to facilitate the relationship between China and ASEAN and enhance cooperation among member states of ASEAN. The two leaders also exchanged views on the latest hotspot international issues. The situation in the Korean Peninsula is causing concern, and in particular the recent missile launches. Prior to his meeting with Xi, Li also met with top legislator Zhang Zhejiang. The two sides agreed to deepen legislative cooperation. Dr. Wang, people, I mean observers uh, who follow the relationship between Singapore and China used to take it for granted that there's no problem with this uh, bilateral relationship, particularly when you look at the remarks and wisdom of uh, Li Kuan Yu, the founding father of uh, modern Singapore. He always attached great importance uh, to the rise of China and its regional implications. China ha has introduced a lot of uh, uh, experiences of governance uh, from uh, the first generation of uh, Singaporean leadership. However, these years, with the maritime disputes flaring up, Singapore, though it's not uh, one of the claimants in the disputes, was openly supportive of the international arbitration or the ruling, and China was, of course, was of course very unhappy and felt upset. This time around, do you think the official visit by Li Xianlong, the second of his time, of his kind, in one month with uh, President Xi Jinping, aimed to uh, mend the fence and improve the strained relationship. To what degree do you think we're going to have any serious deli deliverables? Well, I think uh, uh, first of all, uh, we should always remember, as uh, I think President Xi uh, pointed out during his uh, meeting uh, with uh, Prime Minister Li Xianlong, uh, China and Singapore actually ha have enjoyed a very long uh, a tr traditional friendship between, t between these two countries. Um, and I think you, uh, your question also, also the one background of, of what has been going on is a structural change, which is the rise of China and relative decline of the United States, and of course the recent years uh, flat up of the uh, maritime disputes in the South China Sea. And uh, Singapore, uh, due to its own unique position uh, in uh, this region, uh, take a position that you know China actually has some differences, disagreement with. Um, therefore, uh, we actually witnessed uh, uh, some of the problem in the past few years. And this visit is very important. Uh, I think it carries both very uh, important uh, substantive meaning, but also, uh, I think, very significant symbolic political sim uh, symbolism because Prime Minister Li Xianlong, uh, he is scheduled to uh, take a visit, stay visit to the United States uh, after this uh, visit. So he uh, takes this visit first to China and then to the United States. So, so I think it carries a lot of uh, symbolism uh, as well. 
And in terms of the uh, deliverables you mentioned that, I think uh, it's very clear uh, this uh, visit uh, very much focused on uh, further sub substantiate the economic cooperation between China and Singapore, um, and also, of course, um, uh, guided by the Belt and Road Initiative, this, uh, 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 this idea I think uh, Singapore uh, is clearly also very much uh, embracing. Let me go to Professor Lin Tai Wei, adjunct research fellow with the National University of Singapore on the recent feedback of the local media towards the uh, implications of the official visit by Li Xianlong. Well, this official visit, which will last four days, uh, happened against the backdrop of uh, intensive uh, preparations for the upcoming 19th National Congress of the uh, Central Committee of uh, CPC. I mean, this is indeed the most busy political season for the uh, Communist Party of China. And uh, miraculously and surprisingly, the official visit took place at this moment. And of course, Prime Minister Li Xianlong expressed gratitude uh, uh, for this uh, invitation. Now, what do you make of uh, the timing of his official visit? And how do you look at the local media response in Singapore? That the two countries have bilaterally amongst the top leaders so it has, been, uh, a vis uh, it has been an annual visit for the past few years. The only exception was 2015. That was because President Xi Jinping came uh, from uh, Beijing to visit uh, Singapore. So this is part of the regular visit to shore up the strong uh, bilateral relations uh, between uh, the <coughs> two uh, countries. And Prime Minister Li himself has said that uh, this relationship will advance with the times, with the changing uh, conditions the strength of uh, both economies. Uh, he understands that it's uh, very great and very grateful that he's coming at a time where he knows that the top leaders of China are very busy with uh, the uh, uh, 19th uh, Party Congress uh, preparation. So he has expressed this uh, to uh, the uh, Chinese leadership as well. And you can see that the spectrum of uh, people, uh, personalities that he's meeting uh, on this trip reflects a very comprehensive uh, set of uh, meetings with top leaders in various political institutions holding various political portfolios from top leaders and core leader like President Xi to uh, Premier Li who, uh, who was the one that issued the invitation to uh, uh, top leaders like uh, Zhang Zhejiang, a uh, top legislator and also uh, Mr. Wang Qishan who is uh, the head and uh, commission uh, of, uh, in, in charge of the anti-corruption uh, <coughs> campaign. So you can see this is a very comprehensive uh, visit with a uh, dialogue with a set of leaders in a very comprehensive way across the spectrum of uh, Chinese political institutions holding different uh, portfolio. Many there people are clearly aware, Professor Lim, many people on both sides of Singapore and China are clearly aware of the substantial economic and trade relationship between Singapore and China. Af after all, Singapore is the richest economy in the uh, ASEAN 10 uh, framework. There's no question about that. However, uh, as we have noticed, the relations uh, uh, starts to decline because of the uh, South China Sea. And many of the observers in the mainland say, look, on the surface, we have a very practical economic relationship. But on the security issues, you take side with the United States. You disagree with China openly on the South China Sea. And also, if you look at other counts or fronts, Singapore adopts a pro-Taiwan relationship, hence some of the armor, uh, armors were detained on their way back uh, from a military training in si Taiwan to Singapore, and the military hardware was detained in the stopover of Hong Kong. Now, these things, if you put them together into one perspective, in fact, the undercurrent of the relationship uh, still looks pretty uncertain, and there's a lot of uh, factors of un unpredictability concerning the bilateral relationship. What do you think of the efforts by Singapore to balance uh, the post Lee Kuan Yew uh, diplomacy with the major powers in the region, I mean in the Asia-Pacific region? I think uh, Singapore is very proactive as an early supporter of the uh, Belt and Road Initiative, which is the most important foreign uh, economic foreign diplomatic uh, initiative uh, by China. And uh, actually, this is also echoed by the Chinese leadership, and they are very happy and grateful for uh, Singapore's uh, early support uh, in the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. At the uh, center of the Belt and Road Initiative is uh, Singapore's third 
government to government uh, projects uh, in Chongqing. So if you look at the brief uh, history uh, of uh, the uh, government to government projects, the first one was in uh, Suzhou Industrial Park, where both sides uh, came up uh, with a plan to build and uh, showcase an industrial park that can be replicated, at least the successful features can be replicated. And then the second government to government project is the Tianjin Echo City project. And in the Tianjin Echo City project, you can see that there's an accent uh, on environmental sustainability. So you can see there's an evolution involved uh, in the government to government relationship in G to G projects, government to government projects in both cases. And then comes uh, the third government to government project in Chongqing. And Chongqing is another showcase of how the uh, two countries are working in different areas, in different grounds, because this is uh, Singapore's very first experience uh, in running uh, government to go government to government project in the western part of China. First time it is doing in the western hinterlands of China instead of the eastern coastal areas. So there's a lot of uh, evolution involved in the uh, government to government relationship and these showcases uh, uh, actually shows and demonstrates uh, the, uh, the strong uh, cooperation between the two countries and most importantly it shows evolution with the times moving from a showcase industrial park to environmental sustainability and to the current state uh, of uh, Chongqing, which is uh, complementarity with the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. And with this uh, Chongqing project, connectivity project, uh, there will be many uh, types of uh, projects that can be spawned from uh, this uh, particular initiative. Projects uh, which both countries have laid out in finance uh, sector, in the legal sector, in uh, intellectual property rights, in uh, food safety, in many other... Uh, uh Very quickly, uh, Professor Lim, what do you make of the absence of uh, Prime Minister Li Xianlong from the summit meeting of Belt and Road Initiative uh, in Beijing? He was absent, and that generated a lot of headlines. Very quickly, what do you think of that impact, given the fact that uh, Singapore has been a financial hub as well as uh, a center of maritime transportation, uh, given uh, the Malacca Street? Now, why was your Prime Minister absent? Very quickly. Now, if you look at this uh, context uh, of uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, Singapore is actually the only country that's involved in both the maritime component of the Belt and Road Initiative as well as the overland uh, uh, component of the Belt and Road Initiative. So maritime-wise, Singapore hopes to become an operational headquarters for Chinese companies that want to invest in Southeast Asia. And Singapore is also hoping to be a pathfinder for Southeast Asian countries and companies who want to invest in uh, China. So in this way, Singapore is playing a useful and utilitarian role that enables uh, uh, both Southeast Asian region investments and Chinese investments uh, from China to be able to cross invest in each other. At the same time, it is the only Southeast Asian country that is involved in a government-to-government -government project in the overland component uh, of the uh, Belt and Road Initiative through the Chongqing Connectivity Initiative. So with this uh, kind of uh, 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 results and outcome uh, in terms of support for the Belt and Road Initiative, you can see that Singapore is fully engaged in uh, China's most important economic uh, diplomatic initiative known as the Belt and Road Initiative. And I think this is reflected uh, this time in the bilateral uh, exchanges uh, and also visits uh, by uh, Prime Minister Li uh, to Beijing. And these uh, points were also reiterated uh, during uh, Prime Minister Li's uh, top uh, uh, meeting with leaders uh, and also from uh, Chinese leaders uh, to uh, Singapore's delegation. Thank so you so I much, uh, Professor uh, Lim. Thank uh, you so much for your comments on the bilateral relationship, particularly the relevance, relevance of Singapore in building the Belt and Road Initiative. And thank you, uh, Dr. Wang, for being part of the first uh, half of our show concerning a uh, relationship that may have uh, regional implications, a lot of them, for the prosperity and the boom of uh, ASEAN and China's relationship with this regional bloc. Thank you very much. We'll be back in a short while. Stay with us, please.
Welcome back. We are happy to be joined here by Mr. Ravish Bhatia, a Yancheng Academy Scholar at Peking University. Also, we are joined by Dr. Wang Dong. Welcome to our discussion about the India-China relationship. Now, Dr. Wang, you have just wrapped up a, a, an academic tour of India and uh, paid a visit to some of the think tanks uh, in New Delhi. Now, your visit uh, happened uh, in the aftermath of the Donglang border dispute. What was the general feeling or broad picture concerning the academic exchange on issues of common concern at this particular defining moment about our bilateral relationship? Well, I think my uh, general takeaway of this uh, uh, trip uh, is that uh, actually, uh, to my surprise, I think the majority of the, uh, the scholars, experts, and senior practitioners in uh, India I have uh, talked to, uh, the uh, sort of, uh, uh, with almost no exception, they all agree that uh, the China-India relations are so important. They agree that the differences between like, the border issues uh, will have to be well managed. And they also, every, or virtually every one of them, emphasize the importance of uh, further deepen the economic uh, cooperation ties between the two countries and including the cultural, social, people-to-people -people exchanges. So I think this is also uh, some, uh, 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 something that I personally very much agree upon. Probably, Ravish, um, the border issues could be managed easily compared mm -hmm. with the Kashmir and India-Pakistan relationship. The most important project of the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, mm -hmm. has met serious uh, frustrations arising from India, which questions uh, the fact that this uh, corridor is likely to pass uh, through Kashmir, yeah. uh, disputed territory. What do you think of the adversity of such circumstances? Is it uh, easy for both sides to jointly overcome and adopt a forward-looking attitude? Is it easy? Absolutely not. No. <laughs> uh, I think what happened uh, in the case of CPEC is, uh, or in the larger scale of Belt and Road Initiative, was that um, the decision, had it been made in with India on the table, would probably have looked differently. Uh, India supports Pakistan's development economically, and uh, it sees no harm in bilateral relationships between Pakistan and China. Uh, what it would have hoped, or what it still hopes, is that the, the corridor, the projects that pass through Gilgit Baltistan, uh, instead of questioning uh, India's, India's um, right to that region, because they question India's right to that region, and had Belt and Road Initiative not questioned India's sovereignty, India would have been much more open to play a more active role in the Belt and Road In other words, uh, India clearly felt that it had been marginalized uh, in the process of negotiation concerning the future of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. India should have been consulted in the first place. Yeah. And also the name of uh, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor should be altered a little bit uh, to live up to your expectations somehow so that all, all sides would feel more comfortable. Yeah. Is that your point? My point is that um, I don't Putting in Chinese investments into uh, an area that is clearly I considered by India as disputed between India and Pakistan means that China takes, is taking sides. And then to expect India to play up to or uh, agree with whatever China says and be a part of the larger Belt and Road Initiative is sort of unreasonable uh, in, in some ways. Uh, and I think that is where the dispute, part of the issue lies. Was India marginalized? Uh, maybe, maybe not because uh, there already existed a highway that passed through that region, which was the Karakoram Highway. Now, Dr. Wang, is it a very difficult job for China to keep a subtle balance between Pakistan and India, the uh, most important regional players in South Asia, if you look at the Xiamen Declaration, which, is, uh, wi which listed uh, some of the uh, uh, organizations as uh, terrorist organizations, and uh, Akhani Network uh, and Masood. Uh, these two names uh, were pretty striking for Islamabad, yeah. and they showed open unhappiness and displeasure. Mm -hmm. Very quickly, uh, our Foreign Minister Wang Yi said, uh, there's no question about the old-weather friendship between Beijing mm -hmm. and Islamabad. Mm -hmm. So what do you think of the, uh, the, the mixed feeling, quote unquote, on the side of Beijing? Mm -hmm. um, uh, do you believe we have to make a choice between India and Pakistan? Well, of course not. I think, uh, of course, you know, as uh, uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi uh, has pointed out, uh, uh, Pakistan is uh, uh, all-weather uh, uh, 
partner and friend, and there's no doubt about that. Um, but uh, India is also uh, a very important partner. Um, and, um, and as the uh, President she also noted, a uh, healthy and stable and constructive uh, China-India relations are in the fundamental interest of our two peoples. So, so I think there's no need for China to make a choice between uh, Pakistan and, and, uh, and India. And in fact, I think we encourage uh, the two, uh, in Pakistan and India, to, uh, to sort of work out their differences, first and foremost uh, in, the, in, the, in the Kashmir issue through uh, diplomacy and dialogue consultation. And uh, we also encourage uh, them to improve their relations because we believe this is, uh, will be uh, for the, the peace and the stability and the prosperity of the, of the whole region. And China definitely also working hard toward that as well. What are the other most important issues on the agenda uh, during academic uh, discussion with your Indian counterparts? Mm -hmm. um, economic cooperation, mm -hmm. Shanghai Cooperation Organization, mm -hmm. uh, their own version about the uh, Silk Road, because mm -hmm. the India comes mm -hmm. up with their own version, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. a very uh, ambitious blueprint right. about the regional integration with a strong mm -hmm. support from Tokyo. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, it's one thing very interesting about my trip is that it almost uh, coincident, uh, with, uh, uh, coincides with uh, the tr a visit by uh, Japanese Prime Minister Abe. So uh, my uh, Indian host was joking that while you know Prime Minister Modi is hosting Prime Minister Abe and uh, we are hosting you, Professor Wang. So, so I, think, um, I think my feeling is that um, uh, a as I was talking to my India uh, counterparts, colleagues, uh, is that it is very important for uh, India also to make a distinction between what is real and what is imagined. Uh, it is understandable that, uh, that you know, India as a great power, big power, uh, well, uh, there will be some realistic calculation, geopolitical calculation, and therefore some gesture measures of balance of power, et cetera. But it's also very important to understand the limit to what those uh, measures can bring about, and uh, the importance of not uh, sort of targeting, you know, uh, but the improvement in uh, India-Japanese relationship in, uh, I think, in uh, no way sort of be uh, aimed at uh, targeting China. And I think the India uh, friends need to understand that. Uh, Ravish, what do you think of the issue of uh, nationalism? In China, we have a Global Times, right, mm -hmm. which is often quoted by Western think tanks, uh, politicians, policymakers as the uh, most influential media player to uh, try to figure out what the general public in China actually uh, think of uh, some of the critical issues. In India, I was always uh, told by uh, Indian friends, look, they have to handle uh, very radical sentiments mm -hmm. and the issue of uh, nationalism, uh, m which may have been reflected largely by BJP, the ruling party. So what, what do you think of our concern? I don't, I don't see many concerns there. I don't think nationalism is a bad thing uh, at the first set. Uh, it drives a country to come together. India is a very diverse country with many different religions, dialects, languages. Uh, and in many sense, it is, the it is the world's largest democracy. So having a sense of nationalism to proceed towards a common goal is something that both India and China share. And it's a good thing because it brings people together. So, well, nationalism uh, we may serve as a driving force uh, for domestic economic uh, construction mm -hmm. for the well-being of the uh, Modi governance, mm -hmm. but it may not be necessarily a blessing for foreign relationship. For example, nationalism could be taken advantage of by politicians uh, to divert the public attention from domestic economic woes to the alleged external threats. And therefore, that will be the bulk of what we call self-fulfilling prophecy. And that will mm -hmm. add to the importance of a military-industrial complex. Mm -hmm. And that will fuel the sense of a militancy. Mm -hmm. And do you think that will serve the national interest of India when it comes to how to improve the relationship with the most dynamic economy in the mm -hmm. world? Yeah, tomorrow, it will be the biggest economic superpower. I think um, I, I understand your definition of nationalism. But uh, from an Indian perspective, our definition of nationalism is very different. Mm -hmm. uh, we believe that nationalism means working towards common set of goals, uh, and, and, they, and, they, and they require everybody to work together to have a common set of goals. Uh, and that is the driving force for nationalism in India. Uh, would different parties come up, and uh, would there be points of dispute? Of course there will be. 
because they come from different cultures and they are different backgrounds and every province or every region would have their own uh, agenda to put forth. Uh, but that does not take away from the fact that the process is, is, is very fair. Would there be trends that emerge out of it uh, that are emerging across the globe? Of course there will be. Uh, but is that a big concern? I don't think so. Uh, In the general context of uh, populism, nationalism, isolationism, trade protectionism, do you think uh, foreign policy is likely to be taken hostage by the rising sentiment of nationalism, or would I say ultra-nationalism? And do you think this is a dangerous uh, to shape a healthy trend of development, I mean diplomatic development? Well, I think generally speaking, uh, in uh, in principle, I think the, the political leader should be also, uh, I, I agree with Ravish, the importance of nationalism and particularly it's healthy from patriotism, or this is what we call it, uh, in terms of mobilizing people and uh, develop the whole country. Uh, but from a sort of a, a, a political and theoretical point of view, I think we sh a political leader should also be cautious about some of the uh, constraints the nationalism might bring to their policy making process. And uh, this is some, uh, sometimes it will be difficult uh, to, to try to uh, strike a balance. Uh, uh, but this is what, what I think politi uh, political leaders would have to do. But, but uh, some of the uh, radical nationalist sentiments uh, will be taken advantage of when authorities in New Delhi would have to reconsider the Chinese offer to invest in some of your teller infrastructure, for example, mm -hmm. a mega project uh, which might be of uh, strategic importance, and then national security is likely to be cited as a reason to bar the Chinese investment. Mm -hmm. and, and that will not serve the national interest uh, of India because uh, uh, you cannot always politicize uh, mm -hmm. all the trade and investment projects. I think um, he he here's the thing not every project that China does not get in India is, is, uh, is factored in by security interests. Maybe the Chinese investors or businessmen need to consider that some other party is offering a better deal. I know that there are concerns that Japanese investors are maybe investing uh, in the same projects that Chinese investors are competing for, but then not a lot of these decisions are not actually based on national interest but pure economics. And Pure economics, by going by, by numbers itself, Chinese investments in India have gone up drastically, including sectors such as telecommunication and communication in general, which were erstwhile close to a lot of foreign direct investment. So I think uh, this requires a sense of better understanding of how the Indian system works for Chinese investors to enter into it and, and tap on these projects. It's not always security related. Well, observers uh, of our program or audiences of dialogue uh, may also take a second look at the nationalist sentiments in China, mm -hmm. which might be uh, harmful for us to shape a healthy perception on our neighboring countries such as India. Mm -hmm. That's a common, an issue of common concern, not mm -hmm. just about India, yeah. but in China we also have the haunting specter of nationalism, which is a very controversial topic for academic discussion. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for both of your participation. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.